Imagine the experience of observing the Salt Lake Valley about a hundred years ago when that was its footprint. Imagine this view up City Creek when City Creek was still City Creek and the nascent valley and what its potential was. Imagine a time Imagine a time when you were the first mappers of this place and the predominant features on the map were the names of its creeks with their original Native American names. In this city named after water, imagine this creek that had the name Napopa flowing down through our valley into the Jordan River and onto the Great Salt Lake through the urban agriculture which was this valley at the time. Well, what's happened to City Creek? City Creek is now a mall. I am proposing to you today as an outcome of our TEDx 2.0 on cities that we rename City Creek today, giving it the oral tradition back to Napopa. When I walk with my friends and I say, I'll meet you at City Creek, what, like the Apple store? <laughs> the language we use to identify the, identify the places we care about is absolutely vital. So I invite you, if you will, to begin referring to the actual creek again as Napopa. How have we expressed historically our care for this creek? This is a creek that forever changed irrigation practices throughout the United States. When Brigham Young settled this valley, he and some brilliant engineers, whether they were licensed or not, makes no difference, began to find ways to manage this fragile water of our valley so that it fed the people of this place. How have we expressed our care for this? Well, we capped it. This is one of the many places in the Salt Lake Valley where we capped our water. We have along the Wasatch Front seven Canyon, seven Canyon Creeks from our snow catching mountains. It delivers water that we all need, and we capped it. This is the corner of North Temple and State Street. And this was a place, before it was changed, that captured the auto guano that fell from any of everybody's cars. In those days, it included the asbestos from our brakes, our antifreeze, our motor oil, that leaking gasoline, and all the other detritus which falls off of these cars that we seem to care so much about. That was the parking lot. which was then collected and washed down on top of Napopa. For those of us who find the detritus of the automobile to be among the most heinous things we do to ourselves and these places we love, the opportunity to transform Napopa into something else, something other than a mall, is something that hopefully we will all be doing again soon. You know, as we pass gas through our engines and out of our tailpipes, sometimes we are blind to what we are really doing. We, we don't really think about it. That, tail, that tailpipe is behind it. What we leave is behind us. That, tail, that tailpipe is something we don't even see it in a rearview mirror. It's there. You know, I, there are two things that I'm really partial to. One is water, and the other one is air. And in our Salt Lake Valley, it's hard to imagine anything more important, anything more fragile, and anything more difficult for us to manage right now. One of the things that I propose as we honestly address this crisis of our time 
as we honestly look what's behind us, why don't we hang little tags on our tailpipes? This half, you can't see it, this says toxic poison. I know it's redundant, but why are we honest about this? You know, there's a story about a young boy and his dad on the LA freeway, and the dad gets really angry because uh, there's a traffic jam. And he's getting angry and angry. He's getting that road rage and he says, I am just so tired of this traffic. And he, his young boy says to him, well, Dad, we are the traffic. How do we honestly engage? How do we honestly express our values? How do we honestly begin to recover from the problems that we are so much a part of? You know, the, the way that we uh, primp our tailpipes is sometimes just so vulgar. Somehow this helps us deny it a little more. We'll put a bow on it. We'll put a pretty bow on it. Um, this denial, this cognitive dissonance we have as we move through time and space, um, we forget to remember what we leave behind. I propose that perhaps as a solution to this, at least one of the solutions to this, that um, along with our dashboard tells us how fast we're going, how much gas we're using, uh, how fast we're driving, what the temperature is inside, what the temperature is outside. Um, interesting, we have these cameras now behind our cars just in case we, there might be somebody. We don't see the tailpipe, but what if we had a spectrometer? What if we had a spectrometer that tells us how much carbon monoxide we're leaving behind as we drive? What if we had a a, uh, something that tells us the nitrous oxide we're leaving behind us. What if we knew how many particulates we left behind? I think that one of the stories of the mapping of this place is what do we leave behind? So let's go back to this parking lot for a moment, which I had the great privilege of, of working to transform years ago, and that's what it is today. Napopa Park. It says City Creek Park. I don't know if anybody's going to tag that or not, but um, it's known as City Creek Park. Let's go back again. We have the ability, as so many of our speakers have talked about today, to reimagine our future. Can we continue to transform these places? Can we continue to heal and repair these places and make them habitat again? I know this seems to be, you know, maybe a little bit cute to show the ducklings and the duck, but we didn't plant these. They found their way back there. And for those of you who spent time in Napopa Park in the spring, you will find this happens every year. It is as perennial as the grass, and we've got to get that grass out of there, by the way. It's a place for people. One of the things about the ability to convert this place as a place for people is that it not only converts the environment, but it recreates the democracy of space where anybody is invited to come and celebrate whatever it is that matters to them, births, deaths, rites of passage, um, or just a summer's day. That's the new entry. Instead of two driveways into a parking lot, there's now a walkway. There are walkways for people of every ability. And there are little markers to remind us of what our relationships are with the other species as you walk up Napopa, up the canyon seven miles. If you keep walking, you can actually end up in a, in a different county. Um, the other day when I was uh, Googling images for pictures, I found this. Uh, this is actually my son's foot um, when he was a, a few months old. We inked and sandblasted to be one of the animals that uh, is in the park. And uh, those are actually Candy Chang's feet. I took her on a walk there one day, if you know the artist Candy Chang, and I found on her website a quote that says, the most important encounter is the encounter with ourselves. And to find that somehow my son, my six-month-old son's foot, inspired a new relationship with herself in a walk in the popa. Uh, reminded me of the power of this work. We're there with other animals. We see other animals. Um, it's part of our relationship with the family of things. Later on, I had the great privilege of creating a Lilliputian diorama of the seven canyons that ring our oasis on the edge of a desert. And this is Seven Canyons Fountain a place where children are allowed to explore their relationships with water, their relationship with geology, their relationships with a blue fescue. You know, Stephen Johnson, uh, in, in his book about creativity, 
talked about having a slow hunch, and slow hunch is one kind of creativity that we have. And so over the years, as I've been thinking about what might we do to continue to heal and repair this valley, which has so often been abused by mistakes made, the unintended, unintended consequences of our wisdom, the slow hunch has been, what if we were to truly, truly daylight all seven of our canyon creeks, from the mouths of the canyons, all the way down to the Jordan River, and that became a part of our emerging infrastructure. What if we acknowledge honestly the things we've left behind, like burying our creeks? I don't know how many of you know the Salt Lake Valley well enough to know that there, there is not one creek, not one creek that you can walk from the mouth of its canyon to the Jordan River. There was even two weeks ago in the Salt Lake Tribune and the Deseret News, a celebration of old photographs showing our, our ingenuity being able to bury these creeks. Is there anything more important? Is there anything more important on our planet than our water? 80% of you is water. That's important. Wouldn't it be important if we, as a city named after water, began to restore the dignity of our place by its name and aligning that name with our infrastructure? This project, uh, the Daylighting the Creeks of the Seven Canyons, was done by my undergraduate students about three years ago. They liked the idea that I had been talking about for a long time. These students did a magnificent job in beginning to illustrate what this might be. When you begin to look at 30, from 30,000 feet at the way that our hydrology feeds into the hydrology of the Intermountain West and is, in fact, part of the hydrology of the world, I mean, if you stop for a minute and think about this, was this once part of the Nile? Was this once part of the Ganges? Was this once someone's tears? It is all one water, and we only have one water on the planet. What's our relationship from here in this Rocky Mountain desert to the other places in the world? It's worth exploring. What if we had, if we restored these riparian ways and included along the way bicycle corridors, transit corridors. It became a part of an infrastructure from the mouths of each canyon to the Jordan River. Get out of the Jordan River, get in a canoe, head on down and enjoy the um, magnificent and unique place which is our great Salt Lake City. So the students began to illustrate this. More students have become interested in this over the years. And starting again this spring, we're gonna take it up again because this is not just an imagination. We can create in this, in this uh, community a conservation land trust, so over the course of 100 years, we can actually accomplish this. I have been a part of a number of projects that people said would be impossible. Um, bringing tracks to Salt Lake City was going to be impossible. Getting tracks up at the University of Utah was going to be impossible. All of these impossibilities, that's usually my first clue that we can get it done. <laughs> You know, the Greeks have a saying that wise men plant trees under whose shade they will never sit. And I can imagine that time 100 years from now when these waterways have been opened, not because the EPA has demanded it, not because we have to avoid the kind of toxicities from fertilizers, um, household poisons, all those other things that are being washed into our rivers. Um, I can imagine a time when this has been opened because we care is we have been able to imagine a city that has this unique ability to bring water as a daily part of our life into every aspect of our lives. You know, we've had an opportunity here. This is a drawing for the new uh, um, uh, a streetcar going into, parks in, uh, into Sugar House, a, an incredible project that could never happen, of course. Oh, you'll never get a streetcar into Sugar House. Um, we had 147 miles of streetcars in this town which were removed in 1946 and 1947 and we'll never get them back, right? Well, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen, you helped get this done. But there is no Parley's Creek in here, an opportunity that we should perhaps pursue in the not too distant future. Come back to, with me for, to, to Napopa for just a moment. Um, for those of you who are familiar in the walks up these places which Mark Strand often said, um, as summer sunlight falling through the golden folds of afternoon brightens up the air, we mark our progress by what, by what we leave behind. Well, behind us, here's an intersection for you. An intersection of private property, two Chevron lines across City Creek. I just took this photograph last week. An intersection, if you can see the water below from Napopa, 
you can see this spider web of barbed wire to hopefully keep people out from creating perhaps another episode like we had uh, two years ago at Red Butte Creek. What is our responsibility in this? How do we reclaim a waterway? Most people I ask believe that water is a human right. I believe that the purity of our water is a human right, that we should not have to fear someone coming to Napopa and somehow undoing this intersection. So another idea. We heard a few moments ago about the Olympics. When I was working with Rocky Anderson on the Olympics to create a legacy project, um, one of those moments when I was sitting with Mitt Romney in Rocky's office proposing what we would do for a legacy project, I said, it's very unusual, um, Mr. Romney, that uh, here in the desert we held the Winter Olympics. How is it that never in any of the Olympic organizing committees language, in any of their brochures, at no time, they would say we had the greatest snow on Earth. How, how is that? It's a very big planet. There is some really beautiful snow. Somehow we have the greatest snow on Earth. But never did you mark that every Winter Olympic sport, every one is water sport. At no point did we acknowledge that. So I suggested that we create a water museum, a museum that honors the substance that gave us the ability to welcome the world here. So again, with University of Utah students, we decided to explore this a few years ago, which was to make just a small incision, not to lay a building on top of the land, but to create a small incision and place in there a facility that would be a, mu a museum that would invite people to immerse themselves, immerse themselves and maybe clear some of the fog that, that keeps us from honestly acknowledging the importance of water in the West and place it in the side of this mountain, a place that isn't about the science of water, but the culture of water. Imagine viewing ourselves from a museum, a museum that allows us to have a gate, a gate up to a, natural, a nature preserve area, which is the upper part of City Creek, and begin to think of it not in terms of our obligations, but our love of the water. A place where we have uh, uh, ice, sculpture con uh, uh, ice sculpture contests in the winter, wa water tasting contests, the best watermelon that you can buy. A place where you can uh, uh, show films, poetry, um, all of the celebrations about the culture of water. We're born and we are baptized in many cultures. We die and we are ritually watched in many, in many cultures, but somehow in between, water is mundane. So I leave with you just one small thought. I have no idea what you see in a drop of water. Every one of us sees something different. It depends on where we are in our lives. It can be tear, it can be sweat, it can be the world. But if we use today in TED 2.0 about cities to reimagine the long term, 100 years from now, and the role that water can have, maybe one drop can inspire a new conversation. Thank you.